You know how like sometimes you pick a stock and it's just a complete loser? Yes. Yeah. Well, normally you would shed the stock, right? But for some reason, you know, I picked a football team and they're complete uh, losers <laughs> and uh, I'm still long the football team. I've I, look, I've been a I have been a blues rugby fan since 1995 when they became a team, like when the, wow. when the league they're in started. Uh-huh. And at the beginning, like the first seven years of that was amazing they were they were the really? championship they started side. out yeah. strong that's they weird started strong it's like the- and then i had to deal with like 2002 until 2019 well let me tell you this it was dude. bad it was it was dark times so there. we have two bag holders we have a rugby bag holder over there <laughs> on that side of the microphone and on this side of the microphone i have an nfl bag holder yeah that's fair Did you know that over $5 trillion exchanges hands on a daily basis? That's an average of over $220 billion an hour. Now how does this much money move every single day and why does it move the way it does? Here on Drunkonomics, two bartenders who also happen to be students at the University of Nebraska Graduate School of Business are going to sit down and drink to the global economy and try and translate it into English. So sit back, relax, pour yourself a stiff one, and have a drink with us to the comedy that is the global economy. Right, guys, welcome back to Drunkonomics, the drinking podcast with an economics problem. Uh, for those of you wondering, yes, that was me coughing. No, well, it wasn't the not COVID. Well, it's not, not COVID. It's absolutely not COVID. <laughs> okay, it is. cool. Uh, I have we we have, as you may or may not notice from our Twitter and from the rest of our social media. By the time you're hearing this. We have finally received the Drunkonomics shot glasses. Yes. These aren't for mass consumption yet, so they're not for they're they're not available necessarily. Unfortunately, they're, they're not available to the general public. As far as I know, there's only five in existence. But the new Drunkonomics yes. shot glasses that we got from Canelo Christian, Dude. they are awesome. Thank you so it's much. Handcrafted, it just, it, like so. They're handcrafted. Yeah, I wasn't paying attention as I as I was drinking, and I got a little bit of the uh, the ethanol up my nose. Oh and no. It's, well, at least you're you drinking the right goes. stuff with it. You know, I mean, you, you got the bottle well, of absolutely. You got the I'm, Michter's I'm American my, whiskey, man. So you can't really go wrong. I'm having as the, long as uh, you're consuming it. Isla Single Malt. Oh, I thought you were drinking Michter's from it, man. I wasn't. I'm well, still whatever. holding onto that. I'm, I'm holding onto that Michter's bottle. Oh, you got to uh, cherish that yeah. for celebration of something. Oh, Maybe nice. around the time that's, I drink my uh, yes. bush light. Is that what we agreed on for the? Oh uh, yeah, Natty? that's right. Yeah, I still owe you one of those. Exactly. All right, whatever. All right, guys. Sounds good. Say, but welcome back to Drunkenomics. The the cast we going. I am your more gracious host, James Goldwater. Across from me yeah, yeah. in the great state of Texas is the less gracious host, Aaron Wong. Yep. Less gracious for multiple reasons, but the VIX is definitely the first among them right now. Yeah, right now, that's what it is. The second reason was, you know, my poor team, my poor Arizona Cardinals, and I are bag holders today because they lost against the formerly known as St. Louis Rams, now LA Rams, yesterday night in the wild card game. That was that was a tough game yeah, to watch. It, uh, uh, it, was, unless you were a uh, unless you're a Rams fan, <laughs> let's put it well, that way. I mean, why would, um, why would why would anyone be a Rams fan? Well, apparently they win. Whoa! Uh, sorry, I'm oh, sorry. I'm man. so sorry. I had yeah. to, I had to well, do it. If you also want to join um, James on the trash talking train, you can trash talk me at Drunkenomical. D r u n k u n m i c a l. That's us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and you can even find us on LinkedIn. I've been doing some long, not long form, but longer form posts on Facebook and LinkedIn. Hopefully they're intuitive. Hopefully they arouse some sort of curiosity about whatever it is that I'm posting about. Maybe they do. Maybe they yeah. don't. No, um, I don't know. And it's there for you guys. Jump on there. If you want. So you could see images of the awesome work Christian was doing for us. Yeah. It's These, handcrafted. Uh, pretty sweet little shot yeah, glasses. Woodwork. That's the other awesome great thing you can find on our social media. Or in those posts, you can find the invite link oh, yeah. to the Discord. Discord, right? exactly. So join the conversation there. Tell K Nello that you saw our cover photo on Twitter or our post on Instagram. And be like, whoa, dude, you are a master woodworker. Is that a is that the way you say it? I have no idea. Calm down, Geppetto. That sounds terrible. I mean, but- <laughs> I don't know. That sounds terrible, <laughs> but whatever. Um, yeah. Either way, join the conversation there. We have a bunch of great channels. You can throw memes, talk about trades, talk about talk whatever about you're how, drinking. Talk about how, ask us how, questions. Just how to how to source information what uh yeah exactly. what else is going on but speaking of sourcing information what a what an eventful week. week last it, two uh, it, last oh like man last like Usually seven january's days. january's kind of slow well dude it's been really part. quiet like i mean like the last two episodes we didn't have very much news to cover and then this week it's like boom like you know we were trying to talk about glass to which we will talk about at the end of the episode because that's, i think it's a very important banking regulation absolutely that was passed as much as I want to talk about that, there's so much news to cover. And we're going to try and get through it as fast as we can. Yeah. So I think starting with, I think the big one, 
if you want to call it the big one, is the Fed nominees. Uh, yeah, that's it's pretty big. I mean, because it's what it's um, three. Is it is it two or three? Yeah. Right? So it's two governors and then a Fed like chairwoman, chair yeah, and a chairperson, yeah, a chairperson. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, that's right. So basically, Jerome. Not Jerome Powell. Wow. Uh, Joe Biden nominated. Very different. Yeah. Two different, completely different people. I mean, old Um, white guys, but different. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Very different. So Jerome Powell nominated Sarah Bloom Raskin. She's been working with the Fed for a while. Uh, She she served as governor for a little bit. And then uh, now they nominated her to be a vice chair of supervision for, uh, yeah, yeah, vice chair of supervision. That's the, that's actually the title. That's yeah, the full that's name of the title. That's, that's, yeah, yeah like, so it's a regular it's a regulatory role. Uh, it's just kind of making sure that rules are being followed. I think I, I think that's what the role is. Uh, very important nominee. Uh, she's been at the Fed for a long time. A little bit more progressive. Uh, you um, know, I would between say. Her and the, uh, I think all three nominees. I think they're good candidates. I think it's. I think. The, yeah, and then the, I'm not entirely convinced that you necessarily want like a fed that reflects everything about a society, but I certainly think you want one that reflect that that's more in tune with what the society represents than not. Absolutely. So that, you know, mm-hmm. you can sit here and say like, Oh, it needs to be blank. Many people with le- with no college education. It's like, well, hang on. Well, that, yeah, exactly. That does not work. But when you can say, well, we need to have probably 40% of Americans live under a certain income threshold. So maybe we should have people who research or whose focus is what happens to them when we do things. Yeah, exactly. It might be so, kind of a critical. Uh, yeah, it's not a bad thing to be more in tune with everything. Absolutely. So these three nominations. So it's you know the two governors are um, Lisa Cook, and then the other one is Philip Jefferson. Both of them yeah. come from economic backgrounds. That that was their major. That that's what they did their masters and PhD in. Um, I think they both have PhDs. To my knowledge, they do. Uh, Sarah Bloom Raskin also comes from an economics background. I think she worked in government pretty much her whole career. I think they still need to go through some sort of final approval, uh, like approval process or something like that. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, so they still need to go. Th- they still need yeah. to be confirmed. So they'll be confirmed by the Senate. That's what it is. And I don't think they're going to have any problem with that. I, I, I don't. I yeah. Mean, it, once it, they get approved, they'll get some. They'll get I some think, flack, but they'll get through. I think. I, I think so too. And once they do. This will probably be the most diverse the Fed board and its governors has ever been. Yeah, exactly. Um, and the two governors, so Cook and uh, I guess Dr. Cook and Dr. Jefferson. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure Cook has a PhD, but I don't. Yeah, she does. Okay, cool. There you go. Yeah, uh, so so, with, most of, with most with most people in the Fed, you can assume they have a PhD. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So <laughs> it's kind of yeah. how that. So Dr. Cook and Dr. Jefferson. I guess we can call them doctors. They got the PhD in economics. They're both really focused in like lower income. I don't want to say poverty level, but like really lower income economics. Well, yeah, to be fair, the, the entire premise of poverty level is a really interesting topic in like po- terms yeah. of what is counted and what isn't counted when we're trying to determine what poverty yeah, is. Yeah, because like, like the two is look at it. Like if you make less than this amount a year, then you're considered in poverty. Or you can look at it as you're the bottom this percent, yeah. right? Which two completely different metrics, right? It is. And then and then it's when we're trying to, when we say like there's a flat rate amount, like if you earn less than blank amount, you're in poverty. Right. The next thing is, how do we determine that that dollar amount is what poverty is? And the thing is, I, I think that poverty in this, in, specifically in the U.S., has been kept as an artificially low number. Right. Because when they course. say, like, oh, well, if you're only paying this much for rent, and I'm like, and all Whoa. I can think every time I see the number is, where are they renting? Because that, that is doesn't wonderful. Exist. Yeah. It doesn't like, exist. I, I mean, so it's like yeah, one exactly. of the best lines I've ever heard in something with someone, uh, they were like, well, why don't we amend the numbers? To be reflective and accurate. And some, and the response was essentially someone going, do you really want to add 25 million Americans to poverty? <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. That's what you want to do? No politician's going to sign off on increasing the poverty Yeah, level. exactly. And it's weird because, you know, guess who controls these metrics? Wait, is that the Department know? of Labor or the Bureau of Labor Statistics? Well, I mean, I don't know if they control the poverty levels, but, but pretty much the people that control how poverty is being measured are the people that kind of run this country. The people that are up for election pretty much every year. I mean, I don't know if these yeah, bureaucrats generally it's, actually, it's, they, actually, you know. They get to determine how, how it's counted so they can make whatever spurious claims they'd like. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I don't know. We'll see if these are good nominations. I mean, it is kind of a more progressive one, which I don't like. I don't necessarily it, think is, is I'd rather that, have a, like, I'd rather have a progressive uh, group than a regressive group. Yeah, that's well, what, that's obviously, kind of, but... I do think fiscally, I do appreciate a little bit of conservatism, I'm but now, a, you know, a, uh, yeah, yeah, instead, of, yeah, instead of a bunch of old white conservatives, ex-bankers, you know, expe- 
it used to be that now it's just now they're shaking things up a little bit. We'll see yeah. what happens. It, is, is it going to help? Is it not going to help? We have no idea. I mean, how are these guys going to tackle inflation? If they've studied, you know, the life of impoverished Americans and things like that. I mean, hopefully they know how to you know combat this inflationary pressure that we're facing currently. I don't know. We'll and, see. And make sure that it doesn't hit, hurt the wrong people. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Cause if we all know inflation hurts, you know, inflation hurts lower income people more than it does. It certainly does. People. So, um, yeah. Well, I guess so, first, uh, I mean, if, if we're going to, if we're going to shake up the Fed, we might as well also shake up some other things. Cause yeah. Cause a bunch of statistics came labor in. Statistics decided they were going to, they were going to change how we look at CPI data. I know. They decided what? 2019 is the base mark year for 2022. Yeah, so, I mean, this is a pretty eye opening thing, right? Because, you know, talking about how we can change the way we measure certain data, such as poverty levels. Well, we can also change the way we measure CPI data now. And CPI, I think, is a big indicator of inflation. A lot of people like it. A lot of people just look at the CPI numbers. Yeah, CPI is a great basket to yeah, look at. Yeah, a lot of people just look at, you know, this is you know, year over year increase in CPI, that's inflation. Yeah, it's, um, a, it's fair. And it, yeah, of course it is. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's not inaccurate, right? Obviously, I think PPI has a little bit to do with it too. But it, it does depends yeah, on who you are. Yeah, exactly. At. But that's for a subject that we'll talk about five minutes from now. But CPI data, yeah, the, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics decided that they're going to change the way they measure CPI data. They're going to compare 2022 CPI data with now 2019 CPI I, data. Yeah, so, it's I, and all I can say is I, under, I understand what they're trying to do. That being said, doing it in election year doesn't look great. Of course, that, that's actually a really good to point. Be fair, yeah, this because this is an election year for the for you know, it's sort of things so. you don't have people, you don't you don't put more people in poverty and you don't. And you don't want to have high inflation in an election. Exactly. Year. Because we all um, know, like, I mean, if you look at Biden's approval rating, which I don't really want to get political, but if you look at his approval rating, as not inflation, great. well, yeah, well, as, and it's, it's directly correlated with inflation. Scott just hit me already. But yeah, like as inflation has gone up, Biden's approval rating has gone down, which is not a surprise to anybody. I mean, no, it on. really shouldn't. So, be. But. It's, you know, and it's one of those things where, and I know I'm kind of jumping the gun on one of these, but when you see things like, oh, we're going to change the CPI so we can just, so essentially what they're trying to do is they're trying to smooth the inflation numbers out. So it's like, yeah. look, of course this year's number looks huge compared to last year's. Last year was a weird down year. Um, it's just like China's GDP is rose 8.1% in 2021, according to them, yeah, compared which- to... 2020. Well, it's like, well, of course it did. 2020, you were shut yeah, down. Exactly. I mean, and China had negative GDP in 2020. Yeah. 2020. Yeah. And so, of so course. It's, so it's like, guys, that's a useless metric. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, there's two ways of really looking at the way the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, you know, there's two ways to look at the fact that they're changing this, right? So there's one, like, okay, like, you know, who's paying you to do this? Who's paying you to smooth these numbers out? Given that this is an election year and people are trying to get reelected, you know, are you trying to make yourselves look good? In an election year, mm-hmm. people that are currently in place, or you know what, the last two years were really a complete anomaly. Yeah, like, the last two years so aren't fair comparisons. So let's go just, back to the last year that was normal, and we'll yeah. pretend that this year is normal. And I can understand that. I can yeah. respect it. But a, that being said, I want to I want to look at all the data instead of just going, "Well, we've uh, we've changed the basis that we're looking at. We've changed the um, yeah. We changed the. It's the third quarter. We're changing the rules now. Yeah, exactly. And, um, so uh, yeah, and now, and now you can't. Uh, and now you can't tackle yeah. Tom Brady. Yeah, and all of a sudden, pass interference is you know. Like Only applies any to content, one team. Right? Yeah, it's it's yeah, or whatever it is. Yeah, so yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, so it's, it's a little bit weird. I don't I don't know. Um, you know, it's not inherently a bad thing, but I am suspicious. Yeah, me too. There is a grain of salt. I would I would like. Yeah, exactly. So I, I yeah way. exactly. So I I would I prefer them just to, to come out with both, like you know, year over year, and then 2022 with 2019 pre COVID, but at the same time. They change the way they measure CPI anyways. I mean, it, but usually the way they change it is like, what do they measure? Like used cars, um, gas, food. I mean, what, yeah, what foods? It's what, what are we comparing? Yeah. So, I mean, every, it's, yeah. it's just like, you can look at the provisions. I mean, every year it seems like it's they almost change. always, it's almost always what they're, what they're comparing. So they'll compare different things yeah. versus, so it's like, what can sit, what can, what constitutes the CPI yeah. versus when are we comparing? Yeah. So like, yeah, I mean, it's basically like it's you're looking at an old fashioned with four year old rye versus eight year old rye. That's pretty yeah. what it is. It's you one know. thing to compare. It's one thing to can change the constituent parts. Be like, oh yeah, this is different. Versus it's another thing to be like, oh yeah, we've totally changed. But yeah, I mean, with that said, you know, I, I think I think the CPI data flows right into the PPI data. PPI 
mm-hmm. for the month of December came out at 10%. That's producer price index. And that's what producers are paying for. Since it's just raw materials that they eventually convert into finished goods. Usually that's what it is. It, it, you know, it spans around to a lot of other things too, but came in at 10%. Um, this is at a time in which profit margins are pretty much record highs for um, a lot of the S&P 500 companies. So I think we might be entering well, that, into a quarter where- All that where, tells me is people have raised prices. Yeah. Well, I just, I think it's just the supply chain tightening, really. And it's not it's unexpected. Just, yeah. It's like, look, the uh, here it is. Like when the supply chains are tighter, what happens to the supply? It goes down. Well, what happens to prices when supply goes down? Prices go up. So PPI, of course, will hit 10%. And this is all in the midst of oil import prices falling, which is kind of weird. Maybe the OPEC 400,000 barrel increase per day is actually affecting oil prices a little bit now. I have, I, I uh, doubt it. I mean, that's, that's yeah, that's 400,000 barrels a day is nothing. I mean, it's ex- it's an extreme. I think we've had a slightly milder yeah. winter in some parts of the world than we were otherwise expecting thus far. It is, I think that is entirely possible you know, too. Doesn't, yeah, because last winter here in Dallas was terrible. Right now, it's been pretty. As I say, by this time last year, snow, we had snow. So, We'd had a lot yeah. of snow on the ground that was sitting, and about approximately this time last year, I had to dig channel through two feet of snow so that yep. Flynn could Flynn. go to the yard. Little, yeah, he's little a good Flynn. Dog. He's a good kid. Little Flynn, that, that little dog. Yeah. Hope he gets yeah, the attention he deserves, boy. man. <laughs> he does have a drunkenomics bandana, so it's he looks true. Great. There you go. So he at least looks the part. But Absolutely. Yeah. From there, uh, you know, supply chain concerns, I think, are starting to flow into home builder confidence. I mean, this data just came out this morning or yesterday. I don't know. And today's Tuesday, January 18th, 2022. Because the home builder confidence. It's a lot of supply chain issues. Materials coming in, timber going, you know, obviously with the coup. It's down though, which is funny. Yeah. I wonder if, I wonder if that's actually related to related to rates. Because I know. So I, I, that's what I'm saying. Are, uh, like your home loan interest rates are, I think, three and 3.7, 370. They're I think at all-time lows. It, Let's put that they're way. all-time lows, but then, they're reaching highs from their all-time. And they keep going up. So like they're at like. 18 month highs or something like that. I can't remember what the number was. So it could be the home builder confidence falling could be because of that. It could be because of supply chain concerns. It could be because of the Maya Marku. Uh, yeah, there's, you know a, there's I mean? a lot of, there's a lot of things that's affecting them. And I don't yeah. think there's, uh, yeah, exactly. There, I, you know, there's my no thing is, if I was going to say there's one thing that yeah. I would look at that if I was, you know, if this is home builder confidence, everything else, if I was looking at something that I'd be nervous about, it would be essentially, boy, home prices are at all time highs. And I'm not sure there isn't about to be a, a bubble quick. that's going to pop. And if yeah. that happens, do I want to be holding a lot of work in process in, or work in progress inventory? Yeah, exactly. That I then can't. Well, and that's what happened in twenty in two thousand eight when yeah. there's all these unfinished homes. I mean, like look in Arizona where like where I grew up, and that's where the housing crisis hit. Yeah, Florida hard. was no. Uh, oh, of course, yeah, Florida was pretty bad too. Yeah, exactly. exactly yeah, so there yeah. you go. So you probably drove through communities, which I did when I was growing up. Like I drove through communities where there are just a bunch of unfinished houses, and they just got finished about two years ago because. In 2008, the home builders took on a lot of work. They were willing to take on these projects, but they couldn't finish them because everybody defaulted on loans. On the plus side, they're still in better shape than Chinese property developers. Exactly. Yeah. And speaking of which, you know, we talked about China GDP going up 810 basis points. That's just insane. Which again, again, we're back to this. Okay. So they're comparing GDP to last year. And my response would be, one, I'm suspicious of your numbers immediately because I don't trust them. How do you have an energy crisis from January exactly. until mid-November, early to so mid-November. Are they, still, are they still exporting stuff? Because last I saw, they were still exporting a lot of random stuff. They are. I don't, I don't so know. My issue, though, is is when they when you sit here and say, so- They um, stopped importing coal. From, Fitch came yeah. out and said, the Chinese energy crisis has been solved. It was solved in early November. With, what? Yeah, they've increased coal production, internal coal production, and things are fine. Electricity is going to be fine. No so more they increase, black, no, no more blackouts. No more energy. They increased internal coal production by seventy percent because that's how much they're bringing well, in from Australia. They did a bunch so, of things I mean? to balance it so they'd have so they'd have consistent power. Now my response to that is, okay, let's accept that that's true. Yeah. However, they've done it. My issue is, yeah. <laughs> how do you have legitimate economic growth if for five sixths of the year? You didn't have enough power to run your industry consistently. Yeah, like I said, I don't believe you. Yeah. Also, eight point one percent compared to last year when you were when you went negative. Of course, growth yeah. is amazing. Well, I, this okay, year. wait. Actually, in twenty twenty, I'm not sure if they actually went negative because I thought they were. I remember we talked about this. Like they, they were right they, on goose. They egg. they, they oh, we, okay, we right. concluded they must have gone negative because they admitted. Well, Boy, it's just barely above zero. Well, what they did was they actually shut down their entire every, country. Because every marker they stopped at, they were basically. 
they're maybe twenty basis points above essentially where they'd be what where they'd be in technical recession. Yeah. Oh god. Oh yeah. There Which you was go. another so, reason I was very suspicious of their numbers. Yeah. So, so that's it's you know that's why we're kind of suspicious about CPI data being changed. Right. It's kind of like that. Right. It's they're right above recession. Right. It's, their GDP didn't decrease that much. You know. Like if you're gonna lie, right threshold. actually lie. Like well, yeah. You know. if, yeah. If, if you're gonna lie, like don't just be. It's, it's it's like when you go to a liquor store and you say you're 21. It's like just say 24. Right. Like, yeah. I mean, I, your, your odds I are better. Right. I'm not encouraging you to do that. I'm not encouraging you to do that because don't do that. But I'm just saying. Yeah, it's, don't, it's don't, one don't of those break things. laws. That's that's obviously yeah. a bad idea. Yeah. But I'm just saying. Like, it's tyrant. Like, it's you know. when you it's when you get these dictators overseas who are like, oh, I won the last election with 98 percent of the vote, and it's like. Let's see who just voted. Just say you got a hundred. Yeah, just say you got a- there was no one else on the ballot. Just say you got a hundred. It's fine. Yeah, we all know. You know. We know. Yeah. you know. We know, and we know you know. We know. Yeah, exactly. So it's, if you're just gonna lie, it's, just, it's, just lie. It's like just, with, with, just say um, your GDP. With, just say your GDP went up by twenty percent, China. Okay. Just, just, just say your GDP yeah. is bigger than America's. Okay. Just, just do, do it. it. Just Here's do the it. thing. I actually think it probably. I think the GDP. If you take all the constituent provincial parts of China. And you add those together, I think it actually is bigger than the United States. The problem is between there and the national level, there is so much corruption. Exactly. It doesn't add up. You know, I, I think China could be a very prosperous country. I think there's so much potential there. But I just think the way it's run, the way it's governed, I think it's terrible. Oh, yeah, they, which it's, is why, wait, still, which is why I fear way. for Taiwan. It is, you it know, is I guess. one of the very basic tenants of economic stability is strong property rights. Yeah, exactly. There, there you go. So, so like I, one of the themes that we mention a lot on drug economics is strong property rights is really beneficial for economic growth. And then two, it's, huge. it's, 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 it's probably the most fundamental thing for economic growth uh, or just any it's sort one of, of them. Yeah. yeah any it's sort a, of, it's, yeah. There's five and they kind of say without any of these five, you're not going to have Good. You're not going to have good, prosperous, strong okay, well, economic please, well, growth. Now that you brought it up, we have to mention the five. Oh, God, what are so we, let's see? We've got so, obviously um, property rights. Property and then, rights. You have to have essentially resource capital. So re, you have to have resources. To have human capital. So yep. you have to have people, and then also an educated population. You have to have infrastructure. Yeah. So and then you have to have. Um, it is some sort of education, so you have to have yeah. a basic Which education. Which kind of bakes into infrastructure, but I understand why they think it's different because infrastructure is like you know, can you get around? Can you move? Can you move things around? Can yeah, you, are there like, roads you, that? Yeah, can you farm corn here and ship it over here, right? Or can you extract oil here and push it over there? Stuff like that, right? That's that's infrastructure, and then of course education is kind of a different. Yeah, and then of course from there they they always big in the sixth one, which is that freaking entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah, and I hate that when they when they, they <laughs> which, is, which, which is true, which is not it's not wrong. Well, but, no, but here's the thing: is they're sitting there like, oh, you have to have an entrepreneurial spirit. My response to that is, yeah, that's under human capital. Okay, there it's you go. It's a part of that's human that. capital. You don't yeah, get to exactly. take a chunk out of human capital and go, oh, but this is now the entrepreneurial spirit, the All willingness right. to go to debt. No, that, that's human capital. Uh, I get Someone it. I, was I get it. To do yeah, that. that's yeah, that's, that, that's okay. It's a subsection of so it's a five point five, but. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So, anyways, those are the five. Those are the five principles of economics that you need. China seems like they don't have really any of them. Two actually, ed- education and infrastructure they actually do. Um, they but whatever. Um, anyways, so from there, I really just want to talk about um, just the Russia and Ukraine bonds, just because I think this is just a yeah. nice little follow up to. Yeah. So I mean, so know. so here's what happens when you don't have this economic stability, right? So you have yeah. you end up with. Um, well, so so Ukraine's bonds entered. Um, they're, both bonds are down. They're both in in dangerous territory, and it's because everyone's sitting here going, "Russia." You mean Russia and Ukraine? Russia and Ukraine. Their their bonds yeah. are losing value because people are sitting here going, "Are they about to?" There's just concerns. So you're saying the yields are just going through the roof right now. The, the value on them is plummeting. So it's it's yes, yeah, so the yields um, must be going through the roof. Yeah. So as of this, let's see. Um, Ukrainian bonds have entered distress, is what they're saying. Oh my God, that, that's um, not wow. Yeah, that, that is not something to brag about. I would say. And then Russian bonds um, are also. Oh my God, Russia, falling, dude, Russian dude, Russian bonds just, are at nine point three. Oh my God, dude, if dude, yeah. if American bonds trade at nine point three, can you imagine what that would do to the Nasdaq? Just imagine what that would do it, to the it Nasdaq. Would, it would, it would be would an interesting just, day. That would wreck the, I mean, the reason why the Nasdaq and everything else plummeted today which is the 18th January, right? Mm-hmm. It was because of bad earnings. But the, I think the highest I saw the 10-year was, the U.S. 10-year was 1.87, which is insanely, like the last five years, pretty high. But Russia, 9.5%. That's just insane. That's ridiculous. That means that, I yeah, mean, no, that, it, that no, must mean their bond, that, that, that just means their actual bond is almost worthless. Yeah, no, they're, it's, they're, they're <laughs> in... They're they're in really bad shape, and it's and it's all yeah. because I mean I guess technically you could say that Russia has been invading Ukraine for at this point you know 
seven, eight years. <laughs> what it really boils down to is, is people <laughs> since, think since that 2014, they, is yeah. there is a I suspicion mean. that there may be renewed, you know, renewed fighting. And so, yeah, that's people are just like, well, that's yeah. not going to work for me. So, yeah, and, and pretty much what happens with instability is that whatever the underlying asset is. So if you're if you're buying Russian bonds or if you're buying Ukraine bonds, what you're really doing is you're betting on their economy. You're betting on them being able to provide you a return on you lend, yeah. you loaning that government money. So you're if you're buying a government bond, you're just you're long that economy. Really, that's the way you got to look at it. Yeah, it's a, that's a great way to put it. Yeah, in, in a much more like riskless way. I mean, it's not as risky, but the fact is, when yields go up to nine and a half percent, that means nobody wants to buy it. Because when you think about it, like we mentioned before, when bond yields go up, that means the price of the bond is going down. That means this bond is trading at a steep discount. It means the capital value of it has gone down. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's just that's just the result of this instability, is what that is for both Russia and Ukraine, because we have no yeah. idea no, who's going to cut ties with who. You know, of well, course, with uh, Saudi Aramco. You've got, you've got Russia trying to rebuild the Soviet Union. Yeah, and then Saudi Aramco um, is now going into Poland, which I think is going to help yep. the rest of Europe be less dependent on Russia and their exports and on things Russian like that. oil, yeah. Yeah. It's so, a, yeah, the, the deal as I was reading it, or the proposed deal, would have um, Saudi Aramco essentially in, a, in position to acquire the refinery, the refining equipment, and essentially take over two thirds of yeah. Polish oil refining. So yeah. they would have so two thirds of the market, which Poland's been trying to move away from, from dependence on Russia. So, yeah. and so has the rest of Europe. I mean, literally all like, because just because they kind of view, I don't, I don't know if they do actually view it, but I think everybody else views it as, you know, you're either pro Russia or you're pro America. It's really tough to be pro both. It's you know? yeah. It's yeah. Um, I mean, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this. I hate to just kind of cut this conversation yeah, off. Yeah, no. I think we we have a topic that we're really excited about tonight. With, yeah, uh, I really want to talk about uh, glass. Is that glass? I don't know. I thought it was crystal, sir. Is this, is this crystal? Um, is lead in here? No way. <laughs> wow. But the, the so I was going to say between the uh, Stegall Act. Yeah, I was gonna say it brings uh, us to the glass to glass yeah, Steagall. Steagall. Glass-Steagall. Um, and I'm sorry to just cut the rush conversation short. Maybe we'll talk about it later. But Glass-Steagall, we were supposed to talk about it last week. Someone dropped in a question in our Discord, and I was like, this, Great question. this is I, one of those I questions that it. It, just, it just makes for an entire episode because I think it's just a really fundamental yeah. thing with, with economics, the way they overlook banking. You know, I, I, someone told me that Glass-Steagall is basically like, you know, you have a babysitter and then the kids kind of ruin the house. And instead of going to the babysitter and going like, hey, the kids ruined the house. What were you doing? You're just going straight to the kids and you're not even looking at the babysitters. That's kind of what regulation over the banking industry, that's how people view the I, regulation over the banking industry is just like the parents are just going straight to the kids and blaming the kids instead of going to the babysitter and going like, hey, why did you let the kids ruin the house? Yeah. Right? It, like, why didn't you kind of mitigate this this thing? It's, right? it, to me, kind of the, the Glass-Steagall, if we're going to use that analogy or a similar analogy, to me, Gla what Glass-Steagall did is you stopped putting just the oldest of your own kids in charge and you brought in a totally different party and we're like, hey, well, clearly you can't be trusted. Yeah. It's time to- Well, the reason why I want to make this the actual main subject is because I think I have my opinions on Glass-Steagall. Mm -hmm. And you have your opinions on Glass Steagall. I do, and I don't think our opinions are exactly the same. Probably not. I, I, yeah. So let's just start at the very top. What is Glass Steagall? All right. So um, Glass Steagall was a response to the 1929 uh, market crash. So the great it is the very beginning of the Great Depression, and it was uh, passed in 1933, and it was a response to what was, co what was considered to be Ill, uh, you know improper banking activity. Commercial bank involvement in the, and and, and yeah. problem being commercial bank involvement in the stock. Yeah, markets. exactly. So what happened was the 1929 stock crash happened. Everybody knows that, but basically that happened. It took a few years and since people went. Hey, took, why? <laughs> yeah, why did this happen? And it, there were a bunch of reasons why. I mean, there's I mean, there's way more than yeah. Yeah. So one of them that they, they kind of looked at was well the fact that they were commingling commercial banking practices with investment banking practices and insurance, all that kind of stuff, all that was being, all those funds were being commingled under the same roof. Or, or the banks were performing the same activities. That's, and so it's like, hey, well, hang on. Yeah, um, so I guess we, we should probably define a commercial bank versus an investment yeah. bank. So why separate commercial banking, investment banking, insurance, right? So what is commercial banking versus investment banking? Obviously, those are two completely different practices. Absolutely. So let's start with commercial banking. So the basis of commercial banking is that 
The bank exists. It receives deposits from customers. It issues yep. loans to individuals and businesses. That's the main purpose. Is that yes. it's supposed to it sits on a lot of cash to, that you guys all deposit yeah. into James accounts. It has it holds depositors yep. cash and it loans some of that depositor cash out yep. to to increase economic growth and activity in an area or in a region. So that's that's the that's those are commercial banking activities. Yep. So it's the holding of deposits, secure holding of deposits rather, and then the issuing of personal yep. and small business loans, so, right? So and, and, and the loans, loans, yeah, and the loans are usually what? Cars, houses, and hey, I want to open mm-hmm. up a, a, a new business. Mortgages, business credit, you know, so lines of credit for businesses. Yeah, I want to start a new car dealership. Well, you need money to start I, a car I need, dealership. I need working so. capital to start, a, to start a business. Absolutely. that's yeah. So those are all commercial banking activities. Yes. So that's what we think. Of, when we think of traditional banking, most people think of banking, what they're thinking of is a commercial bank. Yes. That brings us to investment banking. Yeah. So way, investment banking way different. Way is exceptionally different. different. So investment banking is a lot of underwriting of securities. So securities, we need stocks and bonds. Yes, stocks and bonds. Uh, it does a lot of, they do mergers and acquisitions. Yep. They do a lot of consulting. They, um, they they create markets for securities, right? So they create, yeah, they make markets. So the difference between a so so where do the which, where which does the money come from? For an investment yeah, bank, right. an investment bank has investors. People invest in the bank, right? Yeah. So they're they're shareholders. They're not deposit holder. They're not depositors. Yeah, but the bank also invests in the community, but they're in debt, right? So there's yeah. shareholders. So, and then- so, so if you think about what an investment banking, what an investment bank does is the investment bank's job is to buy securities that are going to accru- accrue value. Their job is to invest in businesses, merge businesses, buy off, spin off businesses. They're supposed to. So yeah. their job is to do look at really, really big. Yeah. So when you look at like scale so activity, a, a big ac- a big acquisition. Now, you know, that was recently in the news, Microsoft buying Activision Blizzard. Microsoft Activision. Some investment bank, maybe multiple investment ga- banks kind of oversaw it. They kind of looked over that merger and acquisition. Usually what they do when they do M&A deals is they kind of help Microsoft value a company. And they say, this is what these shares, if you're going to buy this company, these, this is what the shares should be valued at, mm-hmm. whatever it is. Um, and then obviously, they, it's very and labor they, intensive. So that's why there's a big and fee. And they'll also, they'll also talk to Microsoft and say things like, look, if you... There's a few ways to do this. You can start buying up shares, and what and what what that means is essentially that that bank will start buying up the shares for Microsoft. They'll say, "Hey, look, yeah. you want us to start acquiring the shares? We'll do it, and then we'll sell to you at you know essentially yeah. agreed so, upon." Yeah, so rate. Like Microsoft said, "Okay, we're going to buy Activision for sixty nine million dollars, billion. Sorry, sixty nine yep. billion so dollars. Definitely a B. Yeah, not, yeah, not 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 a M, a B." Sixty-nine billion dollars. The nineties. Yeah, and it's not sixty-nine <laughs> billion. I just rounded it up because it's a nice even yeah, number. Sixty something. It was. It was nearly seventy. Is it's that sixty-eight point like, seven? But it's just much it's easier big, to say sixty-nine. Okay, I'm sorry. I don't know why it's yeah, easier to say sixty-nine. It's 69. the biggest tech acquisition since Disney. Seven and, years. Uh, what's Disney? Since, since Disney and Fox. Disney and Fox was probably the biggest one that I've seen in my life. This is the. I thought. I thought I was reading that this is the biggest. Disney and Fox um, is the biggest one I've seen in my, and that was a sixty-five billion dollar merger. This is the. This, this is, is 69. the. This is a record-setting tech yeah, deal. This is sixty-nine billion, which is way easier to say than sixty-eight point seven. Okay. And they were comparing Dell's uh, purchase of EMC yeah. for sixty-seven billion. Okay, six cool. years ago. Yeah. Nothing special about the number sixty-nine. I'm just saying it's much easier to say than sixty-eight point seven. Okay. So. Um, sixty-nine billion dollar deal. Not insubstantial. Not insubstantial. So, and, and, they and, kind and, of consulted and what over else the deal. Is, yeah. And the investment bank is also going to say, like, oh, do you want to do this as a straight cash buy? Do you want to do it as a? Do you want to issue shares? Is this? Yeah. Do you want this to be? A, do you want to buy with shares? So essentially, yeah. so basically, go approach the big shareholders and go, look, we'll swap out your share, your number of shares with Microsoft for the, shares, yeah, for value of shares in Microsoft. Yeah, exactly. It's a very labor intensive process. Investment banks kind of oversee the process. They kind of. Look over the terms. They value both companies and say this is this is what this is a fair exchange. This is there's probably a lot more to it than that. That's not. I'm making it sound way easier than it actually is. But M and A is. I is, mean, so yeah. we also see we, another big thing that investment banks do is we see them other than M and As. We also see that they actually trade securities. Yeah. So like, I mean, if you look one. at if you, if you remember the Big Short, right? They also create markets, right? They, they create, create security, they create whole yeah. new securities and derivatives. Yeah, exactly. Just go completely just, here we go. Here's a new one, right? Uh, they create hey, a credit if, default swap. If you pay right? us this, we'll do this if this happens. Yeah. Essentially, we're just going to create a contract. Yeah, exactly. We'll, yeah, and, and then they'll get guaranteed their cash flow or whatever it is, right? For the, for the default swaps. So yeah, I mean, that's what investment banks do. Like it's, and generally speaking, uh, let's be honest, like I, I'm, Investment banking practices are riskier than commercial banking practices. Absolutely, but but on the other side, like commercial banks, 
they invest in a lot of what you call startups. Now, if you want to call startups not risky, it's also, I mean, that's a, that's your prerogative, right? But like, but like if someone starts a new bar, there's no determining whether or not that bar is going to get any customers, right? But they're going to take Correct. a bank from the commercial bank. So I think they're both pretty risky, but it, I, I think it's unfair to say that commercial banking practices are riskier than investment banking practices. Yeah, so that's, so that's the main um, difference. You have one that's commercial banks, which are meant to be boring, meant to be dull. They're, they get money from you, the depositor, and they loan that out into your community to try and improve the community. Whereas the investment bank takes money from an investor, not a depositor, could lose everything. Yeah. Now, prior well, to 1929... Yeah. I mean, both practices, you could lose everything, but commercial banking... After 1929, we learned that you can lose everything there too because yeah. there was well, nothing to backstop. Well, in both uh, in both practices, like commercial banking, the thing is, one, there's an FDIC now because thanks to the Glass-Steagall Act... The because FDIC, of Glass-Steagall, yeah, created the, the FDIC. Yeah. The big thing about Glass-Steagall glass Gaulle, whatever, glass Eagle, was that it, it established the FDIC. That's and that's probably the biggest. Yeah, that's probably the biggest. The other thing about commercial banking practices is like usually at, at least, you know, even without the FDIC, commercial banking, there's a bigger collateral, right? I mean, the, like the collateral is a little bit more tangible. You default on your loan, we'll take your house. So now we have yeah. a house. Oh, you default right? on you default so, on your on your um, hardware business? Well, we're going to take over the business and all the items inside. inside. Yeah, exactly. We have a, there's an actual physical thing that you can acquire and then sell theoretically to someone else. Yeah, um, recoup some of your loss. Whereas like, you know, if a merger goes tits up, sorry, <laughs> that's, just, that's too bad, right? So yeah, you're, oh, well. But yeah. Basically, uh, the reason why Glass-Steagall was put in place in the first place was obviously there was a conflict of interest. They were commingling funds. They were using funds from commercial banking to kind of leverage Fund the, the investment speculation. Banking. Yeah, because obviously investment banking, you know, it's, it's, it's riskier, but the profit potential is obviously a lot higher, right? Mm-hmm. You're dealing with way bigger companies. So now you're pulling all these commercial banking uh, you know, the cash flows from commercial banking, you take in all that cash flow and you're now using that to kind of subsidize your investment banking practices, which, yeah, I mean, if, if it works out for you, it could it could pay you back big time. I mean, that's it's yeah, it can. a lot of favors. Or as we saw in 1929, it can yeah. be absolutely ruinous. Yeah. So we have, we have Gla- so Glass-Steagall's passed in 1933. Yep. It creates the FDIC. It splits Commercial investment banks and insurance, and and, and, it, and it splits insurance off from both of them. Yeah, and it says and it says essentially to all of them, these are activities that you may not participate in. Yeah, and um, exactly. you know, and there's some funny ones. So I well, think yeah, one of the ones was like so banks couldn't own ten percent of a non percent of yeah. a business. And businesses couldn't own more than ten percent of a, and a single business couldn't own more than ten percent. Yeah, of so a like, bank. yeah, so like basically, like J.P. Morgan couldn't own ten percent of Caterpillar because Caterpillar is not a bank, and of course, vice versa, because Caterpillar with their investments and their cash, like if they don't know what to do with their cash, they can't buy ten percent of of a, a, a J.P. Yeah. Morgan. Yeah, so that was one of the deals about Glass Steagall. Now, what are the pros and cons of Glass Steagall? For me, for me, the big pro is you get you get kind of insurance. You get the insurance market out of out of the banking market, which is which, nice because um, yeah, because basically, like the, the way insurance works is like you know you have your reserves and then the rest of it you invest, right? And then so like every yeah. month you get a bunch of money, like everybody pays into this pool of money. You invest seventy percent of it, thirty percent of it you keep in cash because if someone files a claim, in the event that you need to make a payout, yeah, then yeah, and so and so, so what you really can't have is you, or what you really don't want is your insurance companies. Being in a bank, or, or your or your bank also being your insurance company and making speculative decisions, so that when the bank wipes itself out, and suddenly you have all these people turning around, going, still, "Yeah, you can wait a minute, your own stock. Yeah. is my insurance policy worthless? That's not good." Well, yeah, I mean, so the, um, I mean, the big the big proponents are basically just you know obviously conflict of interest. I mean, there's mm-hmm. a big conflict of interest line here. If all of a sudden these are all commingled, you can take funds from deposits and use that to finance an M and A deal or or an IPO. Obviously, yeah, that's that's very conflicting. And then of course, banks, big banks that do investment banking practices, they could take a little bit more FDIC insurance because they're saying like, oh no, no, no. well we drew we financed this deal because of you know, because we took funds from this deposit or from these deposits from this region. So this is FDIC insured. So we deserve this bailout from the U.S. government, right? Obviously, you know, it, it fits into the umbrella of, of, conflict, of conflict of interest. Yeah, but, it's, it was, it, yeah, it's, yeah. So it's, it's, uh, it's so was a great uh, idea. And I think still a good thing is, it, it, is that it keeps essentially a bank from being able to take depositors' money and then not 
and essentially gamble with it. It's it's like yeah. gambling with house money. You know, you don't really care. But whereas on, on the opposite side, so like the people that yeah. the people that are against Glass Eagle, so the people like I'm not against Glass Eagle entirely, but I'm against bits and pieces of Glass Eagle. So like, where sure. it's st- so am I. Yeah. But- so like, where Glass Eagle stands right now, I'm actually I don't I don't mind I don't mind where it stands right now. But the main opposition is like. Like are small business loans more riskier than M and A deals? I I don't know. Are they riskier than underwriting securities? Probably not, but but they can be sometimes. It just depends. Yeah, it, it, really it all depends. depends on the case. Now, as a whole, I can say no. Specific yeah. cases, I might say yes. You know, it's it's uh, exactly. I know. So, I, I know the big argument I've always heard is that when you have the two kind of working in house. They they smooth each other out. So yeah. So I mean, you can, one's having a yeah, bad year. Yeah, you can kind of use profits from other business practice to kind of subsidize other Yeah, to make deals. sure that there's still solvency. Yeah, so if, the, you know, if, if like mortgage or business default rates are to like, you know, 11%, it's like, well, we had a good year with underwriting securities and M&A and even speculating the markets. We can use that so to kind of cover. So let's use some of that profit. We'll plow it into the, uh, yeah, or vice the versa, commercial yeah. side and we'll, and we'll, pr- and we'll keep issuing loans and, and underwriting yeah. loans or and vice stuff. versa like all these people refinance we have, we received a lot of cash flows from from commercial banking because all these people refinance now we have a lot of cash from this now we can use that to kind of finance other investment banking practices obviously that can be very beneficial for banks it can also be disastrous right? if it goes wrong right so it's it's uh, yeah exactly. if it works perfectly you're fine if it goes we just if leveraging it goes yeah. wrong yeah you're just it leveraging can go very very wrong the biggest thing the biggest opposition against Glass Eagle is, you know, if Glass Eagle is in place, it doesn't regulate foreign banks. It doesn't regulate like the Deutsche Banks and the RBCs and the UBSs of this world. And Barclays, it doesn't, yeah, and, and it, Barclays, yeah. It, doesn't, it only affects it only affects HSBC. U.S. banks. Yeah, so it makes it tougher for them to compete against those banks. In it a makes global it tougher, market, yeah, it makes it tougher for J.P. Morgan to compete against those banks. You, you know, and. A lot of people want to blame the fact that Glassdeak wasn't implemented well enough. Well, there were appeals they to, want to blame, it in um, yeah, ninety nine and then ninety nine, a little bit in the eighties as well. A lot of bank, yeah, a lot of the eighties and the nineties. Let's put it this way: between Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton, both sides bear some responsibility. Right, here. exactly. So, but my thing is like you know, two thousand eight. Most it seems like most of what happened two thousand eight, and this is just what I know. And feel free to disagree with me, James. But uh, most of two thousand eight. Most of the banks that collapsed were, and obviously the big, the big nine banks were on the brink of collapse. And but that was just their exposure to the other banks. So the the main banks that were just on the brink of solvency were either just strictly commercial banks or strictly investment banks. It's to so my knowledge. The, the, problem, only one, the only one that I know of that was both was Citibank. But Citibank has been bailed out so many times in their history. That yeah, it's just, well. Yeah. I, mm. The problem you have is that banks are so interconnected, whether they're commercial or investment or not. So exactly in the big yeah. short, there's kind of that great scene where, um, or where they go to Florida fail, and they meet. The, the movie Too Big to Fail. I mean, that's that. that I do like Too Big it, to Fail as well. It better than I think the Big Short, but yeah. Uh, well, on. I was going to say that point where they go down to uh, Florida and they meet the real estate, mortgage yeah. writers, oh, the real yeah. estate guys. Yeah. They're yeah. Like they're like they don't. No one checks. No one cares when you when you write these loans and he goes if i write a mortgage friday afternoon a big bank has bought it by monday, monday lunch. lunchtime yeah 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 and so it's this point where it's like you want to think that people will be responsible but the thing about human nature says human nature has no upper limit so that's why you see people that's why people eat too much people drink too yeah. much it's it's yeah. it's what yeah. people it's why people hoard wealth it's what people want want more than they need is, is is they is there's just no upper limit people well, just, yeah. It, it's yeah that's why the circuit breakers nature. going down but none going up so that's the thing is um i think what happened in 1999 i think was 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 well done um i don't like i think personally the reason why the federal government has any say in the way the banking industry is regulated is because of the fdic but i also think at some point the federal government should be like look th- this is what you can do this is what you can't do otherwise it's what you said. There's no upper limit. It's just what can we do to maximize profits, and that's it. And the net, well, my big problem is is that it's not just what can we do to sustainably grow. It's what can we do to maximize profits this quarter, and then you get to the next quarter. It's like what can we do to work? Yeah, exactly. So, so Wells Fargo 
And I bank with Wells Fargo. If you look at Wells Fargo, they had that problem where they were telling their they were telling their uh, bankers, you need to open blank many accounts every month. These are your quotas. Well, if you look at it, at some point, so you Why? have to sit down and go, well, that's that's Why? blank number of accounts every day. I'm in a community of 5,000 people. Good luck, Say I yeah. actually hit my quota of seven new accounts a day, five days a week. You exceed the population well, of your town. In like You exceed the week. population of your town so, in two years, yeah. right? And so it's it's you get to a point where it's like, wait, what? No, yeah, How am I like, supposed no. to... It's it's these are bad metrics, and and when you saw it at Wells Fargo, what they did is you had these these bankers started opening accounts for people that they didn't oh, ask yeah. for, that they didn't want. That so they yeah, didn't they had a bunch of random about. cards. Yeah, I, I remember so, that. That was that was a scandal that was and, and that's went why under if you look five at years ago, yeah. that's why if you look at Wells Fargo, they're still under a lot of scrutiny from FDIC and the SEC about about what they, about their business practices, right? Because yeah. they it was just. They were doing damaging things. Yeah, and the I mean, they're one of those banks that actually they do both, right? They do a lot of investment, I mean, but now a lot of them do. But the thing is, well, it's because it, since nineteen ninety nine, when it, when it got repealed, repealed, yeah, it's now all those practices can be done under the same roof: commercial banking, investment banking, uh, insurance underwriting. All that stuff can be done under the same roof, but the funds can't be commingled. Which I'm okay with that. See, like, I, I, and I, and I, and I, under, and I an understand. Level I would say that's of, an appropriate. Uh, the thing is, they should never be commingled. But at the same time as they should never be commingled, my response then is okay. So I have a I have a company with three departments that can't commingle their funds. Why don't I just have three companies? Because well, if any one of those <laughs> arms making bad choices can bankrupt the, can destroy the other two, then I would say that's a dangerous thing. So like a tripod with three well, legs, if you break one leg out. Yeah, but you can look at it so, that so way. Like, what I mean that is like, okay, you've got the investment side of things, which can really push push but, risk. You have commercial side of things. With If with the loans go bad, it can yeah, pull I mean, the other can, two down with absolutely. it. Absolutely. I mean, and you, you can underwrite look at it that way. insurance, yeah. you can, and you have a massive payout that might cause you to fail, you, you can have issues there too. And so suddenly you've got a commercial bank side of things or an investment bank side of things that are essentially in an organization that's filing for bankruptcy well, protection. So, I mean, we, we, so we, basically what you're saying is you're saying companies like J.P. Morgan Chase, right? Because they're under the same roof. You're saying it'd probably be better off if Chase just split off and then J.P. Morgan just split off and J.P. Morgan did their investment banking practices yeah. and then Chase did their- Because inv- if they can't commingle funds, what's the point of them being under the same roof? What's, what's the point of them being- the same entity because it's like okay well, they, i mean so the, i mean the, the the way i also look at it too is like yeah they can't commingle so like deposits can't be commingled with investment banking practices yeah you can't take but, depositors money to invest in right. um, but the profits in your investment banking side but, yeah but the profits that you receive but from interest from that's a different story and the profits that you receive from consulting practices or the profits that you receive from a good m a deal or from underwriting securities uh-huh. if, if you know jp morgan they write a lot of ipos which we all know. So if they make a, but, a ton yes. of profit, that could u- that could be used to finance a lot of commercial banking deals, right? So yes, I'm just but saying. The, it, but the it, issue I would say is, is you don't take. I would suggest that you do not take profits from your investment banking side of things and then give it to your commercial banking side of things to do more commercial banking. Well, you, you never know. Your investment banking side of. Well, you You're never right. know. It's possible. It's possible that you can do it. But my thing is, but my view would be at this point is I mean, that's not. Probably what they're doing, but you never know because, like, what if they give a lot of the profits that they make from investment banking to commercial banking, and they say, "Okay, you know what? Loan this, this money." Is not what they do, I mean, by the way. If, but they could, they could, right? Because you know, it's their. It's they their, don't, but it's but just, it's, they could because it's their profits, right? So they could say, "Loan this money out." And then once you loan all these profits out, all, like that we've made from investment banking, once, once they're loaned out, we'll take them back into investment banking and then we'll package them into securities and then we'll sell them as bonds. And then we'll take those profits and, and they kind of go back and forth, right? Which I understand. So that so now, now, so now, now what you've described, now, what you've actually just described is you've but you're gotten, but you're disguised, but, but, but it's disguised. Yeah. So, it, right? so now what you've you got what I mean? is a, is an investment bank that makes its money, but it makes it more competitive, loaning money out that it no making bad loans we're back to 2008 well, now They're i understand making- that i totally understand that but it does make them more competitive and my, my thing is now do, do they need to-, to be able to compete with other banks yes yes exactly so uh, that, that's really the big thing is i think I mean, I mean if you take deposits and you say like all right i'm going to use it to finance this m a deal that, that to me is a no-go but if they made Absolutely profits yeah. yeah but like let's say this last month they've made 
you know, two million in interest, and they use that to kind of par- partially finance an M and A deal. That to me is just that's just a normal business practice. I don't I don't think there should be anything interfering with that. I think um, that but now, they can't do it. They, they wouldn't be able to do it if it was under three different roofs. You're right, so. and, and and that means that it breeds a little inefficiency, and I, I don't disagree with that. Um, if they were under three roofs versus the one, but at the same time, I look at it and I go, if if I know now. I'll say this right now. Mm-hmm. Laws do not have spirits. No, they, don't. they do not. Uh, laws are written. And so someone who says, oh, well, what you're doing is against the spirit of the law. Was well, it against the law? Well, no, it's not. <laughs> okay. Then what you have is a poorly written law. Exactly. Um, Write it better. So yeah, yeah, it needs to be written better. Be more or, definitive. Here's the great yeah. thing. You can amend it to exclude whatever they're doing. Yeah. And that's the kind of the thing is you have to, you have to, is, is laws are, are, are structures of man, just like banking is a structure of man. And so you, as time goes on, you have to write new laws to shame the inadequacies of other things. Yeah, well, that's the thing um, with, that, that's the thing with law, with, with lawmaking and investment banking is that a lot of lawmakers don't know a lot about investment banking and a lot of investment bankers have great lawyers. Are, yeah. So, and are paying for the people running the laws. So see, it's, it's well, a lot yeah, easier exactly. when you, yeah. when you, so I suppose what I was trying to say is when you've got, essentially when someone says you cannot be using, you can't use investment bank money for, uh, for commercial purposes, you can't use commercial money for investment purposes. Well, if I can have, if I can give all the profits from my investment bank side to my commercial banking side and say, hey, make these loans, we'll buy and securitize them, and then we'll sell them for more profits on our side, which we'll then give to you to do this again. So that's where profit. you've got a machine that's now, yeah. it is not actively trying to create a benefit to society, economic or otherwise. It, yeah. It's only, it's, it's interest solely becomes self-perpetuating and feeding itself. Yeah. And I think you've got a very well, dangerous. Well, that's the thing is like, if we can, if because, we can because then create- what happens when, when people default on the loans, so the yeah. security packages got like go to, go to garbage, kind of like 2008, suddenly you've got a bank that's based its entire s- structure on, on self-dealing. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is the thing is if we can regulate banks into like, Hey, your business practice now is basically to just benefit society as a whole and to, only operate in their benefit. If we can regulate that into existence, that'd be great, but we can't. No, we absolutely can't. It's, I, it's, I agree with you. Yeah. It's, so it's, that, that's it the thing. It brings is, me to, I think we, we, we talked a long time ago and it was, and it was one point where I said, look, if, if you take a, if you need a government bailout, oh, yeah, you, I know what you're, saying, yeah. you're forbidden from doing stock buybacks for 10 years. Yeah, that's you're fair. For at least 10 years. I know I, re- I wanted 30. Yeah, but, I want 20. You know, but 30, that, you're forbidden yeah. from doing this. And, and on top of that, another idea that, that occurred when I think we talked about it at one point in the igloo um, was that essentially if you put a, a penny tax or a fractional, a fractional tax on every trade done by a, a bank and you essentially take that to the side and you put it into a fund that cannot be touched, unlike Social Security. So a fund that sits there yeah. and you say essentially <laughs> you to the point where it's like, oh, a bank is a bank has made bad choices and needs to be bailed out. Yeah. Okay. Here's the money. Here's money from this. You have to pay it back and you're under the same constraint, but it's essentially, it, it stops being the taxpayer paying and it's the banks it's the it's bank us paying. going, hey, yeah. banks, you need to put money aside because I know you're going to do something stupid. Yeah, exactly. In the same way, in the same way that the state can compel every driver to have insurance, yeah. you need to have car insurance of certain things because something will happen one day. Yeah. Whether right? it's your fault or not. Yeah. And that's, that's your fault or not. Banks. Yeah. That's the thing about banks is like, you know what, you know, Wells Fargo or JP Morgan, like a lot of banks, a lot of the mid nine major banks, a lot of what they did that ended up making them receive a bailout wasn't necessarily because they no. actually participated in those practices. It was because they invested in companies that did those that that, that they invested those. So like Wachovia, Wachovia was a disaster oh, yeah, exactly. of a bank. Yeah. But yeah. Were other was every bank participating in the same foolishness? No, but maybe they were. Or maybe they loaned holding money. the securities, yeah, but they they were holding the mortgage backed securities that had gone to no value. Yeah, so but, they or, were, or maybe they, they they helped other banks get the leverage they needed to be able to take uh-huh. on more of those risky assets, right? So it's stuff like that. And so, and so it, that's when we start talking about this cross exposure between commercial and investment banking. That when yeah. they're all in the same houses. When they're all together and then they're doing these things with each other, it's like, oh, yeah, I know. You, you're you're not commingling funds, but you're all so exposed. No, exactly, to each other which is which is, that- which is a real shame. And like I said, I don't mind the way 
glass to eagle is because I to, to a point you need the free market to kind of be the free market. You need the banks to kind of be banks. Um, I, you know, my view is in, I agree. I agree with you that we need the free market to be the free market, but at the same time, free market lets things fail. Exactly. So let them fail. Uh, hey, so that's where I'm with you. Is if they make dumb decisions, let them fail. But I also understand, like if J.P. Morgan, I'll help invests, your. I'll help your. You know what? You know, okay, you know, you've got your pension funds, you've got all these funds that are in there in, in the government. It's going to hurt. You're going to hurt, reti- you're going to hurt people. And I know you're going to hurt people if you let things fail. And that was the big argument in 2008 is you yeah, can't exactly. let it fail because too many people will get hurt. And my response to that is, okay, we'll protect people from getting hurt. My response after to that, kind of looking at 2008 would have been afterwards is, congratulations, guys, you're all now breaking up. Yeah. You are too big. And, and, and that's, that's not well, acceptable. Well, but, that, but, that's, but, but the opposite happened because- They you know, merged. They got they, bigger. <laughs> well, but why do they merge? Was They gave JP Morgan a lot of money. And they said, okay, now you have to buy Chase. You or they gave so-and-so. Bank of America a lot of money and said, hey, now you have to buy Merrill Lynch. Yeah, it was very much what happened. Was, um, it was- it was my one of my personal favorites is that you have I don't know who came up with it I, I I think it was supposedly it was one of kind of Geithner's crazier ideas, which was essentially merge merge commercial and investment together. You can allow the depositors insured money to cover the losses of the investment bank, and it's no, like that, that makes what? no sense. That makes no sense. If you can't at all. commingle, it makes less sense than what I yeah mentioned earlier. If you earlier. can't commingle, so. how can you cover? Yeah. How could you allow that to happen? I mean, I don't know what he was thinking, but all I know is this, is that if he went to myspreadshop.drunkonomics.com and got himself a, uh, a Drunkonomics hoodie or a Drunkonomics hoodie mug. Or, a dr- or another hoodie or another hoodie, I don't know. How many uh, hoodies does he need? I'll be honest. He probably needs two or three. My view <laughs> yeah. is Tim Geithner was. I mean, Tim Geithner help likes stay- to ex- he likes to exercise, so he needs a gym hoodie. Yeah, he needs a running hoodie. He needs a hoodie they can and then the he just needs like a, yeah. a hiding from angry like yeah. institu- like exactly. hiding from angry people hoodie. But he can find all um, of those at drunkenomics.myspreadshop.com. And, and here's the best part. Um, it's not just Tim Geithner. You guys can too. Yes. And if you um, can go there too, if you're already hoodied yeah. out. If you've already got the dog bandana, if you've already got the sweet coffee mug or yeah. other mug, I don't know or what the you hoodie. put in it. It's up to you. Yeah. Or a hoodie. Or, the, or hey, you know hoodie. what? You get a golf shirt and you can be just yeah. like Aaron Wong. Oh or a drunk my God. golf shirt out yeah. on the links. It'd yeah. be pretty sweet, yeah, guys. You can, but you if, can but the if 90s you don't too. want, yeah. but if you're, <laughs> but if that's, if that's not what you're going for at this time, but you still got money in your pocket that you're like, hey, you know, I'd like to do something positive with this. Yeah. There's always patreon.com slash drunkenomics. Yeah. D-R-U-N-K-E-N-O-I-M-S. D-R-U-N-K-E-N-O-M-I-C-S. So I just, I get, so, oh, I just you're get so there, close. I can't do it. Just don't give up, man. Just, just gotta do it. Don't, don't give up like, 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 like glass eagle. Yeah. Right? I mean, so it's patreon. so patreon.com slash drunkenomics. Yeah. D-R-U-N-K-E-O-N. E-N-O-M-I-C-S. I-C-S. Yeah. yeah I, it's so always, close. I get to, I get to drunken and I'm like, yeah, I've, I've done what I needed to do. You're drunk. I'm yeah. Out. You're drunken. So yeah, drunken. you know, it's yeah, because you, you filled um, and killed, you know, absolutely. But, have. Uh, it's been a 2% yeah, I mean, down day and a, a two before the mic's hot. Well, I mean, the, or yeah, more the VIX. Day. Yeah. And the VIX is very high right now, but I mean, you know, Got these, got my sweet yeah. wooden shot glasses. So I gotta, I gotta. I know, seriously, that's, those are awesome, Canelo. But yeah, all I to say is, you know, do your research on Glass Eagle. If you think they should be commingled or not, it's up to you, right? But I laid out my opinion. Well, it's actually not up to you. It's up to, it's up to the law. So that's what determines really, whether or not really they should is. be. But, but come up with your own opinion. This is what we're here yeah, for. Yeah, decide yeah, whether we you agree say stuff and. And sometimes we'll we'll kind of lay out why we think it's happening, but at the end of the day, it's it's your opinion. Um, we're not here to tell you what to think. All we're here to say is we just hope you play chestnut checkers, you fill and kill like I mentioned before, and of course, don't brag, just say. But most importantly, I just really hope that you guys all do that one thing. Um, God, what's that called? I'm gonna need. It's definitely gotta be stay drunk and amical. That's what it is. Cheers, my friend.